The passage we're going to look at now falls fairly neatly into two parts, but we can link them together by asking one question. How mad is Hamlet really? This matters for two reasons. One in the first half because Hamlet sees the ghost, but Gertrude does not. And in the second part, down here, um, Hamlet addresses his mother, and it matters very much to him that she does not think he's mad. And it matters very much to him because if she does think he's mad, then she won't listen to his advice. Um, um, mother, for love of grace, lay not that flattering unction on your soul. Don't um, allow yourself to believe that not your trespass, not your sinning, but my madness speaks. You, my mother, I really want you to believe that your sin is making you feel bad rather than just me ranting at you. So the difficulty Hamlet's got there is that he has just seen the ghost. And having just seen the ghost, um, his mother hasn't seen the ghost, and that does make him look insane. Um, certainly far from the understanding of himself, to borrow Claudius's earlier phrase. Now, Hamlet has doubted whether or not he himself has seen the ghost. If you remember, he's questioned that um, it's really a ghost, or rather that something that proceeds from his weakness or his melancholy. He uses those very useful words just before he proposes to put on the play within the play. The play is the thing with which to catch the conscience of the king. Um, his point being, well, the devil has the power to assume a pleasing shape, and he doesn't know whether or not to trust the ghost. You could argue that that is an example of Hamlet over-intellectualising a problem, of needing proof, of needing rational facts on which to proceed, rather than honour and revenge. Um, so the fact that the ghost reappears here at this extraordinary and chilling moment does provoke him to revenge, makes him think the ghost is real, even though Gertrude can't see it. And then the ghost speaks to him. The ghost says what's probably on the audience's mind. Do not forget, this visitation is but to wet, to sharpen thy almost blunted purpose. Um, and then the ghost comments on, on Gertrude um, himself, uh, um, herself, and he uses language very much like Hamlet's. O oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Um, Hamlet has already said that Gertrude should turn her own eyes onto her soul. And so they're speaking the same language. Now, deep and meaningful point, let's not therefore rule out that they are the same person, that whether or not the ghost is right, and it seems based on the reaction to the play within the play that he is, whether or not the ghost is right, um, he does seem to be voicing uh, Hamlet's own impulses. In the Laurence Olivier 1948 version, the one which plays up the erotic tension between Hamlet and Gertrude at this point, um, it's made all the clearer that the ghost is also voiced by Laurence Olivier. Now, that is um, a trick of cinema, really. It's a film version, and that's something that would be impossible to do on stage. However, when Richard Eyre, much later, directed Jonathan Price in it, um, Jonathan Price did actually do the voice of the ghost as if Hamlet were possessed by the ghost spirit. So that kind of way of rendering the supernatural to a modern audience is something that does play into the idea that Hamlet and the ghost are very much on the same page, using the same language, and are on the same case. Um, so, um, the ghost encourages Hamlet to talk to the Queen. The, you'll, you'll notice Hamlet's language to the Queen is really awkward. It's formal, it's as though, uh, hello, uh, how is it with you, lady? Um, and which you know, enables the Queen to, 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 to talk about how Hamlet is. Now, here, Shakespeare is almost doing stage directions uh, in the Queen's speech. She is describing an involuntary physical response. Things that might be hard for an actor to bring off on the stage, 
but which are therefore all the more emphasised by the kind of painting. Um, so that um, we've got this whole idea of um, forth at your eyes, your spirits wildly peep. Um, you've got hair that's standing on end, like life in excrements. Um, excrements meaning things that grow out of you, I promise. Um, things like hair or, or fingernails. Um, y you can um, detect in the language here some motherly um, devotion to her son and a desire to make sure that he's okay um, and, 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 and some affection. However, there is a massive gulf between Hamlet and his mother, not just because of his views of her crimes, but also because he can see the ghost and she can't. You could argue that this symbolises another difference between them, that Hamlet is haunted by the past um, and a better age in a way that he thinks his mother is not. His mother has gone along with the new regime, seems to have ignored any sense of honour from the past and been exactly like the player queen in The Mousetrap, the play within the play, who, who protests too much, says Gertrude. Um, uh, look you how pale he glares. Now, um, this suggests that Hamlet is seeing something that she can't. Um, but the ghost will leave shortly. You, you can imagine this and by the sped up lines, um, the stichomythia. I'm using that word because the rhythm is very strictly similar. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? Nothing at all. Yet all I see, I see. Or did you say so these lines here are very matched? There's a kind of breathless, almost um, gothic kind of subdued wanting to wanting not to offend the thing. There's nothing but ourselves. There's a kind of intimacy in space and also between between them. Hamlet is describing the ghost to um, the Queen using a kind of dexis, um, indicating it with his hands. Um, and it is, I, I, you could call it dexis because he's, he's pointing to something, he's explaining something to her that she simply can't see. Um, and this is where the, lang the, 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 the passage splits and you get some sense of just how much it matters that Hamlet is sane. This is the very coinage of your brain. This is something that you have made up, again with that line, out of your weakness or your melancholy. This bodiless creation, ecstasy is very cunning in. Um, she refuses to believe that there is a ghost. After all, why should she? Um, she actually has not seen the ghost. But that could be, you could argue, I suppose, that this is because at the moment, her soul is not yet receptive enough to the guilt that Hamlet wants her to feel. And that is what is going on in this speech here. And it's worth a rather closer look. We have all of the language of the individual soul. We have all the language of um, body parts. We have all the language of the contemptus mundi here. The idea that, um, do you remember um, that... Uh, the world seems to him um, a rank and stale promontory. Um, it is an unweeded garden. Things base and rank in nature possess it merely. And the word weeds there and rancor are straight back. This is the same Hamlet as made the speech, oh, that this too, too solid flesh might melt. But this time he's making it to his mother. He's sorted out his thoughts and now he's telling them to somebody who really needs to know them. Now... <clears throat> Um, it's, and this is very straightforward, very plain. This is not madness that I have uttered. And then bring me to the test, and either matter will, will reword, which is true because he does, um, which madness would gamble from. I promise you I could say the same thing over again, and it would make just as much sense. So please do not think that I am, um, that, that, it's, that it's my madness that's speaking rather than your actual sin. You have done wrong. Having established that, he uses his habitual language of bodily disease, corruption, ulcers. Do you remember previously he compared um, he compared uh, the, the roses that should be on a cheek to the blisters that are on her face? And that word rank again. <clears throat> and all the language of contemptus mundi. Now you can 
analyze that um, with that in mind for the bigger picture. You can also look in detail at the rhetorical figures that he's using. Look at how many imperatives there are. Confess, repent, avoid, do not spread, forgive me this. That's five um, virtue, um, and so that's five um, imperatives, um, including, that's before you even count, lay not that flattering unction to your soul, um, um, and bring me to the test. In fact, that's at least um, seven imperatives there. It's a fantastically bossy speech, and it makes its point by shaming, again, by shaming his mother and counting um, all of her, her vices. Um, I say vices, forgive me this, my virtue, you can hear is so heavily sarcastic. Virtue itself of vice must pardon beg. Um, but e you're shaming even virtue. Um, yea, curb and woo for leave to do him good. As we'll see later in the last extract, um, we're beginning to inch towards a point where Hamlet is urging his mother to take an active role in converting and to doing good, actually to master her senses. Later on, you'll see him urging her to get used to abstinence that is hard the first time, but afterwards will become much less of a problem. <laughs>